as with all my presentations, you'll see numbers after assertions and statements. And these numbers, you can just go straight to PubMed, type in the number, and get the abstract and sometime the full article so you can see that if I say something that sounds fantastic, I'm really not pulling it out of thin air. Now, mitochondria and increased oxidative stress. Very important to understand. Remember I said the mitochondria only live, quote unquote, you know, five to 10 days, five to 12 days. So there's a pretty brisk turnover, breakdown and regeneration, breakdown and regeneration. We all think about, or, or what is being talked about a whole lot more these days is mitochondrial disease. Now, I'm not gonna address so much genetic mitochondrial diseases. That's sort of a separate ball of wax, if you will. But just diseases where supposedly the mitochondria aren't functioning as well, aren't producing as much energy as you'd like. Remember, the mitochondria can be no healthier than the cytoplasm. If you have a oxidized cytoplasm, you're gonna have an oxidized mitochondria. If you got a healthy cytoplasm, you may have a healthy mitochondria, you might not, but at least the mitochondria has a chance. The mitochondria have no chance of being healthy and optimally functional if you have basic increased intracellular oxidative stress. Um, and once again, this has to do with glutathione, which is the most concentrated of the intracellular antioxidants, vitamin C, the most concentrated of the extracellular. But make no doubt about it, vitamin C is vital to the intracellular antioxidant capacity by virtue of its ability to continually regenerate oxidized glutathione. So, I like to phrase it this way. I think conceptually the cell and its cytoplasm, along with the subcellular organelles, can be considered as basic support structures for enabling mitochondria and nuclei to optimally perform their functions. And I think that's a good way to approach it. I mentioned the uh, mitochondrial genetic diseases. I'm not going to get so much into that. Interesting thing, too, about mitochondria, which also shows how important vitamin C plays a role with it, is just like the cell itself has glucose and vitamin C transporters, the mitochondria themselves have vitamin C transporters. The same SVCT2 and the GLUT1 transporters are present in mitochondria <coughs> and designed to either actively take up reduced vitamin C or passively intake oxidized vitamin C. And most of what we know about it, we just observe. I don't think we still have anything remotely resembling a sophisticated understanding of what I'm talking about here today. But suffice it to say, it has been well demonstrated that vitamin C administration externally increases mitochondrial vitamin C concentrations. So this brings us back again full circle to the concept that I was saying is that you can't have healthy mitochondria without a healthy cytoplasm. Just not gonna work. Okay. Now, I wrote a book called Death by Calcium, and I'm not going to get into that except to say that all sick cells, 100% as far as I know, have increased intracellular calcium levels. You can't have the increased oxidative stress that is seen in all compromised disease cells unless there's increased intracellular calcium. So, 
what you do with calcium and how you manipulate it inside the cytoplasm has a lot to do with how well you compensate for and adjust to different disease processes. Calcium, for example, in a cell that has increased intracellular calcium can readily be transferred uh, to the mitochondria from the cytoplasm. So the mitochondria can have a buffering effect, if you will, on decreasing the oxidative load inside the cell, but not at the expense of becoming diseased itself. So the only real solution to increase oxidative stress in the cytoplasm that will ultimately be impacted inside the mitochondria is either preventing the calcium from getting in to begin with or finding ways to pull it out. That's what that book addressed. I'm not going to get into how you do all of that, except I will, toward the end of this, show you some of the most important supplements for achieving that goal. <clears throat> so, as I said, right, calcium is a primary regulator of oxidative stress. Interestingly enough, there's a lot of data out there that look at specific toxins, like methylmercury, that's a pretty potent one, and methylmercury toxicity is always associated with the loss of intracellular calcium homeostasis, which means as you get toxicity from methylmercury as a prototypical toxin, not just methylmercury, that toxicity is manifest by increasing the calcium concentrations. And when you get to the point of programmed cell death or frank cell rupture, like with a, a potent chemotherapy, it's always as the calcium level goes higher and higher and higher. Basically, <laughs> calcium is one of the most toxic things you can take. Never supplement calcium. Uh, I'm going to go into other things that help support the mitochondria in a moment. Important to remember about sepsis. <clears throat> sepsis, of course, is an overwhelming infection, usually bacterial. We've seen some of the data lately on vitamin C and sepsis in Virginia and the powerful effect that it has. It's important to remember that the thing that sepsis does is it oxidizes, okay? And the more you can block or reverse that oxidation, the better you do. Now, one of the things also about sepsis is that it oxidizes everything, okay? And this is why once you reach a certain set of clinical parameters and laboratory data in your sepsis, you got about another 24 hours to live and that's it. And one of the things that brings you to that point in time is when the oxidative stress is so high that you've oxidized the cortisol receptors inside the cytoplasm. If cortisol can't bind to its receptors, and what did I say about any biomolecule that's oxidized? It doesn't work. So if you have a hydrocortisone cortisol receptor inside the cell that's oxidized, cortisol can't bind it, and you can't get the protective effects of arguably the most important stress hormone in your body, along with vitamin C, incidentally, hydrocortisone and vitamin C. And in sepsis, the more you oxidize it, the more the body tries to make more cortisol to compensate. But of course, it will never compensate if those receptors remain oxidized. So when you give vitamin C to somebody in advanced sepsis, and this has been demonstrated, you immediately reduce those oxidized hydrocortisone receptors, and then the naturally occurring increased cortisol levels that had been trying to compensate for that now can flood the cells, bind all the receptors, and very quickly bring you back to a normal hemodynamic state while the vitamin C mops up the infection. 
So mitochondrial support agents. Vitamin C, of course. Thiamine, essential for helping to convert pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A. Pantothenic acid, super important supplement, super underutilized, okay? I would only say that if you take pantothenic acid, it's best to take it in the form of pantothene, P-A-N-T-E-T-H-I-N-E, because regular pantothenic acid is calcium pantothenate. In small amounts of supplemented calcium pantothenate, no big deal, but if you supplement large amounts of it, you're getting too much calcium. Riboflavin, coenzyme Q10, some uh, interesting odd supplements that I wasn't familiar with, a synthetic derivative of coenzyme Q10 called edebinone, L-carnitine, and this is another one we have that's fortunately uh, can be taken in a liposome encapsulated form. Creatine, D-ribose, NADH, which is literally a molecule that just helps push the electrons down the electron transport chain. All the different varieties of vitamin E, tocopherols and tocotrienols. A very interesting and unusual and prescription medication called dichloroacetate, which is of incredible use in cancer patients, incidentally, and will rapidly normalize or start to normalize the metabolic syndrome-related abnormal blood works, the glucose and the cholesterol and the triglycerides, etc. Alpha lipoic acid, N acetylcysteine, omega 3 fatty acids, resveratrol, magnesium, and believe me, just because it's number 17 on the list, I don't mean to low rate magnesium. I'll tell you in a moment a little bit more about magnesium that's important to know. And even if I can pronounce it, pyroloquinolone. Oh, okay. Now, supplements to avoid. I'll get back on my soapbox for a moment. Iron should never be taken, ever, unless you have a documented iron deficiency anemia. Iron is the single most potent prooxidant, which means toxin, remember, toxin equal prooxidant, prooxidant equal toxin, Iron is the single most toxic substance you can take on a regular basis, okay? Probably calcium is number two. Iron, copper, and calcium are all essential for life in small amounts. But they're probably much more significant as being essential for cellular death. You got to remember the body has to be able to, under the right circumstance, kill a cell just as readily as it could nurture a cell. That's the dynamic of life, killing some cells, supporting others, otherwise you'd have no features at all. But the important point is all three of these are primary agents for increasing oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is the bad guy. <laughs> 